This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue our conversation with military historian, Vietnam veteran Andrew Bacevich, professor of history and international relations at Boston University, has written a number of books on U.S. military and foreign policy. Just out is Breach of Trust, How Americans Fail Their Soldiers and Their Country. Um, it's very good to have you with us to talk about this. One of the things you talk about is why the world's best military is not winning wars. Why? Well, I think let me uh, answer the question by put it in a historical context. Uh, we have forgotten this. We Americans have forgotten this. But the basis of our military system, going back to the American Revolution, was the citizen soldier, the tradition of a citizen soldier, rooted in the notion that as citizens we have an obligation to come to the country's defense when the country. Uh, is in is in jeopardy, and it is citizen soldiers who preserve the union. It's citizen soldiers who uh, who won World War II. The citizen soldier tradition collapsed, quite frankly, for all kinds of understandable reasons, uh, with the Vietnam War, that that catastrophe. That and you after, were a part of. Yes, uh, at least served in. <laughs> uh, the after the war, uh, we we abandoned that tradition. Uh, Richard Nixon ratified that abandonment by uh, uh, ending the draft and creating what we call the all-volunteer force, which is really a professional army. Now, the professional army offers many advantages. Uh, it's a well-trained, it's well-disciplined, uh, but the record says it really doesn't win wars. In particular, it doesn't hasn't won wars since 9/11. Our excellent, in many respects, military uh, knows how to start wars and doesn't know how to end them. So the story, the military history of the post-9-11 era is a story of protracted wars ending in unsatisfactory ways that cost enormous amounts of money and lives and end up probably reducing America's standing in the world. So the argument of the book is we need to jettison this system based on a professional military. We need to revive the military system based on the tradition of the citizen soldier. How have mercenaries, um, how have private contractors, military contractors, affected the— Well, our—I mean, put simply, uh, we've got too few warriors, too much war. Uh, when uh, the George W. Bush administration launched the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, expecting that they would be short wars won quickly and easily and miscalculated, uh, we ended up with protracted wars and not enough soldiers to get the job done. Uh, and the Bush administration basically filled that gap by inviting in huge numbers of uh, private contractors, which had the effect, of course, war, war has always been, to some degree, for some people, a profit-making enterprise. In our time, it has become, to a far greater extent, a profit-making enterprise, and, and, and an enterprise that invites corruption. You lost your son in Iraq. He went to war like you did. You went to Vietnam. Um, did that change your thinking? Well, it's, it's long been a rule of mine not to uh, want to talk about uh, private matters, but uh, I, I, I don't think so. Well, I mean, of course it does. I mean, you, you, we are all affected by, by personal loss and, and personal tragedy. But my, my skepticism about this military system and its uh, shortcomings certainly uh, preexisted my, my son's death. Death. Um, you talk about needing a national service in this country. What do you mean? Well, I mean, if, if, if one would agree that reviving the citizen-soldier tradition is a good idea, then you say, why? And, and I always get, asked, well, you, there, then you must be in favor of the draft. And I say, well, I'm not, not necessarily in favor of a draft, if only because I don't think a draft is politically uh, feasible. But I do think it would be a good idea for us as citizens to have a conversation about implementing a program of national service. Now, that differs from the draft in this sense. A program of national service is one that says all 18-year-olds, basically kids as they come out of high school, all 18-year-olds owe a period of service to country or community, some of them serving in the military, others serving in a variety of other capacities, whether we're talking Teach for America, Peace Corps, protecting the environment, there would be a myriad of, of opportunities. There's a lot to do in Colorado right now. There's a lot to do in Colorado. From my point of view, a program of national service 
would would close the gap between the military and society, which I think opens the door to a misuse of our military, and simultaneously could enrich the reigning concept of citizenship, you know, suggesting that citizenship isn't simply about uh, prerogatives, it's about obligations and responsibilities, and I think that arguably that would be good for the country as a whole. Andrew Basevich, I want to thank you for being back with us. Andrew Basevich's new book is called Breach of Trust, How Americans Fail Their Soldiers and Their Country. Professor Basevich teaches history and international relations at Boston University, a retired colonel, Vietnam veteran. Um, we thank you for being with us. Thank you very this much. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, Professor Angela Davis talks about her hometown, Birmingham, Alabama.